Yes, thank you, Mark, for having me. Um, again, I'm Dr. Ashley Lauren Joseph. Um, I work currently over at the Mount. I have been there now six months, which is exciting. Um, and I've come out of the CSU system. So working at Cal State LA, Cal Poly Pomona, um, and been in higher ed now since my undergraduate days of being the extra involved student. Um, and it's just become a passion of mine. So super excited to be here with y'all. Explain extra involved student. I've not heard yes. that before. What does that mean? So um, I went to the University of Laverne, go Leos. Um, and during my undergrad years, it was this um, type of influence and mentorship that was ha happening with staff members on campus and with the entering class. So I came out of high school in 2004, started college in fall of 2004, where it was, you need to join a club. You need to be a part of co-curricular co um, advancement on campus. You need to be helping with uh, sports and athletics. Um, if that might not be your area, you need to be in the library working. You need to have a work study job. So I was a part of a little bit of everything. So BSU president, BSU being Black Student Union, at the time it was ASA. Um, I was even the videographer for the track and field team um, because I was not athletic, but my friends were, and I didn't wanna be just hanging out in the dorms on a Saturday, so I would go with them. I was a resident assistant. Um, I had two jobs on campus, one work study, one non-work study. Um, I ended up becoming a Greek with Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Um, so yeah, a little bit of everything. Well, so you're a slacker is what you're saying. Uh-huh, just a little bit. <laughs> well, I, you know, I we clearly got that vibe from you uh, at the conference. And I'm I'm curious, I mean, you exemplify leadership. We could just tell from you. And I'm curious what it was that drew you to cultivating and helping these young women find their the, their leadership lane? Yeah, um, I think a little bit comes from the influences that I had growing up, you know, from my mother, my grandmother, um, my aunts, um, and all of these people were in helping fields. So very much oh. so uh, values-based. So my mom owned her own daycare center where, you know, she had 14 children running around and she was cultivating these young people's minds. Um, I had aunts that had their own businesses uh, throughout the years and same thing with uncles and my dad. Um, and so moving into high school, although I was slightly involved, I was still very much so in my community volunteering and that kind of thing. Um, and I had actually made a plan that I was gonna be a high school guidance counselor um, oh. because my guidance counselor was so awesome. Yeah. She was actually my college counselor, Mrs. Lisa Golden over at King Drew. And so um, when I got into college, someone sought me out, um, Dr. Chip West, and he was like, I see something in you and we need to get you involved. And that kind of just went off from there. Um, and I think I just became like a people connector and it's something that I thrive off of and mm. I absolutely love to do, um, which then of course flows into mentoring and all that kind of stuff. I'm there's uh, on the web page that we have uh, for you and your show. And, and so people can go learn more about you. You talk about this thing called social change leadership. And it, it looks like in 1994, this social change model was, was kind of put out there and, and you thought it was important enough for us to, to link to it. Tell us about that and, and how that's yeah. important in your work. Yeah. So at the Mount um, and, this might help with context too, a little bit about my role there. So as the director of women's leadership, Mount St. Mary's University, Los Angeles is a women's institution, the only one in LA County. Um, and we have two campuses, Doheny, which many folks that live in LA have probably seen down off uh, Adams. And then the other being in Brentwood, um, the Shalon campus. And so we have such a dynamic group of women from all different backgrounds, all different beliefs, although it is historically a Catholic institution, um, and so the social change model really speaks to how I like to transform leaders. Mm. And so I've been doing this since I was at Cal State LA. Um, my supervisor then, Marcus Rodriguez, who I actually um, saw during the conference that I was at this week, um, Marcus introduced this model to me. And he was like, you know, when it comes to student change and leading advocacy efforts, programming, this model really speaks to the values-based work that we do. And so um, as I've gotten through the field and changed jobs and met new students, it just always comes back to the same thing. Mm. Um, and the idea that it connects the individual, the group, 
and the community, which most leadership models don't necessarily do all three of those. Um, and then that's what creates that change and it can go in any direction. So I always think that it's really, um, it really notes how we work with students and how students can work with their environment that they're in. I, I'm thinking back to my days as a student and we were very rebellious. It was a different time, very different time. And I'm, I'm curious how the students are looking at leadership now and how you're helping guide them through maybe some obvious leadership questions they have right now. Yeah, um, I think, and especially this is coming off of COVID, quarantine, Zooming 24 seven. So this is a very, very different group than I've ever had before. Mm. But, um, and I think we kind of talked about this that day that I met you too, how it's this idea of, yes, we need to get students back into leadership roles. We need to teach leadership. We need to make sure that they are, um, they have the values, the language for leadership, but also remembering this group is very different. And so they're not gonna learn the same as five years ago or heck, even three years ago. Um, and so students right now, the question is, how do I become a leader? How do I remain a leader because mm. of retention and life things that are happening around them? Um, and then how do I have the confidence to share my leadership qualities in these clubs, organizations, whatever I'm involved in. Um, I run a group called the Leadership Scholars at Mount St. Mary's, and it's um, actually one of the oldest leadership scholars programs for women in the state. And so this program is cohort-based. Students kind of move through it with a group, which is awesome. Individually, I meet with them, and I always ask them, like, what can I help you build on? What can I help you develop in? 95% of the time, they say, my confidence. Mm. Which is crazy to me because I'm like, you're involved in all these things. I see the confidence spewing out of you, but they don't see it like that. Um, and so recently we started doing like more um, confidence development, speech classes, um, self-care, self-awareness, um, and those type of things to build on their skill set. Well, that kind of begs the question that, uh, and I'm not a sociologist and I'm not a um, I'm not qualified to talk about this in this way, but there's something about um, living on the phone and having this relationship with a screen and not with other people. And I think the group that you have now are digital natives. They've grown mm -hmm. up with technology. So they've grown up. I've seen them, you know, four of them standing and they're texting one another and they're literally a foot away from one another. And, and we also know that there's a tremendous amount of bullying and shaming mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff that happens online, mostly junior high and high school, right? Mm -hmm. By college, we've maybe gotten out of that. But that it, are you dealing with the remnants of that? Somewhat. And I think it's really starting with the millennial generation, too. Like looking at myself, me and my friends, we do the same thing. I could be sitting next to my best friend and literally we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're texting each other, multiple different conversations going at the same time. Um, I think with them though, a lot of folks look at it as a negative that they are so engaged digitally, but it almost creates this new way of them connecting across huh. the globe. And so that's the cool thing about it too. And it's reminding students and also faculty and staff too, that it's okay if your students are in class with a laptop. It's okay if your students want to engage on Twitter in a conversation and then bring that reflection back to the Blackboard Learning Hub um, because they're able to do that across the world, which many generations before them weren't able to do that, at least not that easily. Um, so I think it's a little bit of a mixture there. Let's stay in this lane for a second. You said that they, it's it's being aware of how they learn differently and that, in fact, five years ago, three years ago, I mean, let's say pre-COVID, post-COVID, how does, how is this generation learning differently? So one thing that I've noticed, um, and this is around student affairs work, um, and so student co-curricular being engaged outside of the classroom, and how do we match those up together? Um, students don't necessarily always want to be out and about programming and that kind of thing, which is, I think is very new for me um, because we were taught in the field, you need to have a program going every night. There needs to be stuff going on during the day. And students are like, we are tired. 
Um, and during, for example, orientation this past year with our new students. So first out of high school, um, first generation students coming to orientation overnight. It's a two day experience. And we're like, we're gonna jam pack it. Every minute of the day, they will have something fun or interactive to do. Literally before 8 p.m., right after dinner, students were like, can I just go to the room and go to bed? Like, this is a lot. And I, I think about myself sometimes coming off this conference and I'm like, this was a lot of talking to people and mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. used to that again. And what does that look like for you? And being okay with saying, this is too much for me right now. I need to step away for a minute. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest curves that I've seen with this generation, particularly and mainly because of COVID. Um, mm. And so with my staff, we've been doing workshops and trainings and that kind of thing to make sure that not only our staff is prepared, but across the university, we can really talk about what does that look like for our division based on what we've been taught in graduate school or in past experience now um, and coming in and working with this new set of students. I wonder if there's some uh, some lateral learning we can have for people returning to the office as well. And, Very much and so. right yeah. that that uh, overwhelm and and that sense. I want to ask you. You said something about you said um, I had not heard this before. You said the language of leadership. You teach them the language of leadership. Give yeah. me some examples of that. Yeah. So a few years ago, I was at a conference and I went to this um, workshop and they were talking about career exploration with students. But it wasn't the traditional, you know, how do we get students in internships and in the job field? It was how are we giving students the language to land an internship, to land a job post graduation? And I was mm -hmm. like, what do you mean the language? And when data came in about it, it was saying that students, they're highly involved like overly involved half of the time. Um, they're getting awesome grades, they're studying abroad, but they don't have the language to share how these experiences will make them the best fit for a position. And so it also comes back to leadership too. If I ask a student, are you a leader? Well, yeah, I am. Okay, what do you do? And they're not able to fully explain that and be confident in that. Um, so it was one, actually one of the points of reasons why I ended up at the Mount. Um, I was talking to the VPSA over there and she was telling me a part of my job was leading the framework for the university around Mount Leeds, which is the leadership framework that they use. Um, it was created at the university to help give students the language that they need and um, the connections across different departments, including the academic world too, on how leadership crosses all these different paths. Um, and so no matter where you are at the university, you are part of the leadership hub of campus. So I'm imagining you're matriculating these students out into the workforce, out into and and there are there are junior leaders. I mean, they're the ones mm -hmm. that that are coming out that we now we're going to get some experience in them and we're going to give them jobs and they're going to work their their way up. Um, the lang the cultural language has changed significantly in the last mm -hmm. two or three years around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm curious um, wh where that fits, because I think, you know, me, I represent the the old guard, had a, had a language, and, and that doesn't necessarily work in the workplace today or work, you know, in, in the classroom today. H how much of an emphasis are you placing on uh, DEI kind of languaging? Yeah, I think it's a huge deal. Um, I mean, you can even see in my name, I have my um, pronouns there. Like that's the norm for us right now, which is awesome. And so I think it's twofold. So one is teaching my staff that yes, we have to continue to develop. And so even myself where, you know, some folks might say, Ashley, you're such an expert in X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, eh, I still have some work to do there. Um, so making sure that I'm continually developing in that area, but then also making sure that students are continuing to develop as well. So right now I um, advise Student Government Association and I probably mm. see them the most out of all of my student groups that I uh, see. And I learn every day something new, whether it be around language, whether it's around pronouns, whether it's about um, equity issues happening in the city or in the areas that they come from. And it's so exciting. And if I have questions, being able to have somebody that I can go to 
to even ask those and be in a comfortable space. Um, and I hope that students feel the same when they're in my space and in my office as well. Um, help me understand why when you cross and imagine this line uh, that there seems to be such a um, kind of instant, I'm going to correct you. It, it's, you know, the joke is okay, boomer, you know, I mean, not to me, I'm trying to be as inclusive as I can, but we, we see a lot of that conflict. How do you, yeah. what, what, what's your coaching around that for students? Yeah. Um, I think one of it, one of them is giving people grace, but uh, also not letting people just do what they want. Yo, like, fair enough. Fair enough. If I'm telling you I am this person and this is what I want you to call me and you go and do something completely different. And I always tell them, you can always tell when it's malintentions with someone. Mm. Um, and so even as a staff, when we're talking to other faculty and staff on campus, and even when we go to our, um, our EDJ events and stuff on campus, um, everyone is always really good at remembering this is a learning space. Mm -hmm. And so things will always happen. Things might be said out of turn. Things might be said that are completely incorrect. And that's okay. But ignorance doesn't have to stay in the zone of ignorance. Like we can get out of that. Yeah. Um, and so also reminding them that everyone is ignorant to something. And it's the hope that you will figure out what that is and climb out of that. Part of what you're talking about, you were talking about student government and you, you're you involved in that and you were involved in that in your own college career. And I'm guessing that a lot of people that are in student government think like this would be a great precursor to uh, politics or public administration, you know, writ large. Um, do you see that students are wanting, and I'm looking for a short answer here, wanting to go into politics now, or or are they kind of reticent? Um, I think it depends on the school that they're at, and I think it depends on the area that they live in. Wow. My students at Cal State LA were, uh, like I would say, about that life, and so they knew where they were going. Um, and out of that, we got the mayor of Alhambra, um, Sasha uh, Perez, was one of my former students and she became one of the youngest mayors of that area. Wow. Mount Saint Actually, Mary with, with a, with a mentor like you, these, these women are destined for success. Thanks for helping us understand this so much better. No, thank you.